right, hopefully that works. Let's see if I still got my mouse, I don't. All right, now I do. All right, let's pray. Father in heaven, we give you thanks and praise for this celebration of Epiphany and for this church and for these people gathered here today who continue to seek your word and how to live in this world that you have placed us in in our age. Help us be faithful this day and always and bless our time together. In your name we pray. Amen. Okay, look at that. 930 at the top. Okay, so here's the plan. Each week, uh, I plan to provide a handout for you that should help you have enough information that if you wanted to go home and revisit these ideas, you could, uh, because I'm going to come hot and heavy for seven weeks, all right? My plan is to talk about four or five things every Sunday, and to take about 10 minutes on each of those things, and then to try to leave five to 10 minutes at the end for questions. I don't mind if you raise your hand and have a burning question. But what I can't do is get sidetracked or we'll never finish. Uh, I planned way, way too much material. And uh, that's a, a design flaw on my part, but I don't get too much time with you folks and it's an important topic. So I wanted to get this going. So if someone wants to be my unofficial timekeeper, um, Terry Oswald, you gotta watch out today. Okay, Terry, uh, see how there, there's like uh, 10 minutes for this introduction. So at 940, if I'm not wrapping up the introduction, I kind of want you to give me a little sign, okay? It's the only way we're going to stay on track. If I'm ahead of schedule, don't worry about it. I'll, I'll waste it elsewhere. <laughs> um, all right, so here we go. Taking social justice uh, captive to Christ. That's the title of the class. I've been working on this probably longer than any other Bible study uh, I've ever worked on, uh, partly because I don't have to teach other ones on Sunday morning. So this has kind of been my main focus, but also because I've been confused as a Christian, uh, where to situate myself. And I see the church uh, getting caught up in a lot of things that the culture is embracing. And I think for the most part, uh, it's good intentions on behalf of God's people. They want to help. They want to make the world a better place. Uh, they want to be better Christians. Um, but I also think that what we have to remind ourselves as Christians is what is popular and exciting in the world is almost always at odds with the gospel. Not in every respect, but maybe in some ways that we haven't thought about. And so uh, we're going to talk today about biblical social justice, but we want to always make sure we take this topic captive to Jesus and captive to his word. And so that's what this class is largely about. Um, my wife, obviously, she's not here today. She's protesting this class, so don't ask her about it. Um, no, actually, I have a son homesick today, and so that's why she's not here. But she's leery because this is a hot topic. It's, it's a big topic. She says, why would you want to take on uh, something like that this day and age? And uh, here, here's the one of the main reasons. Right now, the social justice movement is everywhere. Like, it never has been before, at least in my lifetime. Uh, maybe some of you remember the civil rights era. Uh, of the mid 1960s, late 1960s, and uh, so you've maybe lived through some of this stuff before. But uh, for me, it's it's coming on in a, a new and different way than it ever has, and I want to help us think through that. Um, it's in our politics. Just about every day, you can turn on the TV and find something that's related to social justice. It is in our workplaces. Just a show of hands, how many of you in your workplace have had diversity, equity, and inclusion training? Look at that. Look around the room, see all the hands. Uh, it's on our streets. That was certainly true a couple summers ago, um, but it, it's, it's, it's in the pocket, it's in our classrooms. Not yet as I in Lutheran school, but uh, any public school, it's in the classrooms, any college or university, any high school, it's in the classrooms. It's even in our advertisements. Uh, corporate America is bought in to the current rendition of the social justice movement 100%. I don't have time to talk about their involvement in all this because we only have seven lessons. Uh, but just so you know, the whole conglomerate, media, social media, advertising, education, even as you'll see uh, as we go on, uh, the medical industry. And what's that got to do with it? Well, it, it's there as well. And so I want you as faithful disciples of Christ to be able to sort through this Embrace areas you can, and maybe push back against things that are, are unhelpful. Uh, did I mention it's also in our churches? It's in our churches. 
maybe we're a little isolated at being a conservative Lutheran Church, Missouri Synod body. Maybe it hasn't made inroads here, but believe me, it is just about everywhere. You can find books with the title Social Justice Jesus. You can find books with the title Social Justice Pharisees. And so what you see are the church lining up on both sides of this issue. And at some point, probably we as a church or even you as an individual Christian are going to have to think, where do I line up on all this? There's books advocating that we should be a woke church. If you don't know what woke is, you will by the end of this class. Not today, but by the end of this class. And there's also books about how we should be a woke free church. So make no mistake about it. It's everywhere in society and it's even in the church. So I came across this quote. I know nothing about Elizabeth Rundle Charles other than she was an Anglican author. She may be a heretic for all I know, but I agree with her on this quote right here. She said these words. She said, it is the truth which is assailed in any age which tests our fidelity. It is to confess we are called, not merely to profess. She said, if I profess with the loudest voice and the clearest expression every portion of the truth of God, except precisely that little point which the world and the devil are at that moment attacking, I am not confessing Christ, however boldly I may be professing Christianity. Where the battle rages, the loyalty of the soldier is proved. And to be steady on all the battlefield besides is mere flight and disgrace to him if he flinches at that one point. Uh, she did write a biography on Martin Luther at one time. That's, that's the only thing I could find out about her. But what she's saying here is we can go on being the church and confessing the creeds and holding on to Jesus. And we are professing the Christian faith. But if we're going to be a witness, a confessing witness before the world, then we need to stand up in the face of those things which might be contrary to the faith. And we need to have a voice to that because that provides a witness to the world around us. Should never be the main mission of our church, uh, but otherwise uh, we're just living in our own bubble, uh, propagating our own truths for the sake of ourselves. And so I agree with her. Uh, there is a difference. Maybe she could have used different words, but there's a difference between just passing along the faith quietly or being a witness for Christ and his will in the world. Uh, Robert Benny wrote this book in 1995 called The Paradoxical Vision. And he talks about how we're to think about uh, issues in our world. And I'll just build this all the way out here. Uh, he says, in, in Christianity, there's a central core of truth that is handed down through the ages that we are to cling to for our dear life. You might think of these are like the six chief parts of the small catechism or something, or salvation by grace, faith alone. The non-compromising, non Ten Commandments would fall in there. What's God's design for marriage? That's, that's all right there in the central core. Outside of that central core are theological reflection. You could probably think of this like denominations, Baptist, Lutheran, Methodist. How do we reflect on that common faith that we have together? We may have some differences. At the core, it's, it's the same. Um, but as we get on the periphery, there are things that we, we may disagree on. And, and rightly so. Outside of all this, then, our public policy issues, this is where the culture touches on our faith. Okay? And so this may be things like, what's your stance on immigration? Global warming? You know, or taxes? You know? And you can find two Christians, both equally committed and faithful, who might come down on different sides of the, the aisle on that. In, in public policy issues, while we may disagree and rant and rave about them, they, they aren't near as important as the central core. And we, we should be willing to agree to disagree on public policy issues. So here's how I used to think of something like socialism or communism. I used to think, well, you know, some societies have preferred democracy. Some have preferred socialist arrangements. These aren't really important to the, the central core. We may argue and debate their relative merit in the world, but who's to say God has foreordained one or the other, right? But what I've come to realize is that if a public policy issue touches on things that are part of the central core, then we need to be able to speak boldly about those things. And so what I'll show you in a couple of lessons anyway is 
not only has Marxist ideology failed in the world and created a uh, abhorrent bloodshed and suffering, uh, I want you to think about the reason why. Because it's not just a bland public policy issue. Actually, there's parts of that policy that are greatly at odds with the central core of Christianity. Well, we've got to explore that together. And so we might sympathize with the problem it's trying to address. That's great. But we have to look at what are the proposed solutions to the problems we see in society and which ones can we get behind and which ones can't we. Now, I've, I've tipped my hat a little bit in some directions, and I don't mean to do that. Um, but let's just look at a few quotes here. How am I doing, Terry? Oh, I'm not doing good. All right, here we go. <laughs> let's move. Uh, here is Reverend Kerry Gordon, okay? Uh, this guy, I uh, wrote this in a forward of a book. At this moment in American history, the church has become overwhelmingly overrun with what he calls a parasitic false gospel of social justice. Interesting. The very Christian faith that once gave birth to Western civilization has been infiltrated and is even now collapsing under the weight of this parasite. There is a correlation between the political deconstruction of Americanism and the corresponding usurpation of the authentic gospel of Jesus Christ through the counterfeit of the progressive social justice gospel. Now, I'm not saying I agree with everything he's saying there, but here's a man who's in the church who has recognized something problematic, something that social justice in its current manifestation is doing to the gospel. Let's see if he's right or wrong through the next seven weeks, okay? Here's another guy, John Harris, wrote this book, just kind of a lay guy who likes theology. He wrote this. Evangelical progressives believed that their turn to the left was consistent with and based upon the core Christian conviction passed down to them. Jim Wallace had declared the gospel message had nurtured us as children, and we were now, uh, was now turning us against the injustice and the violence of our nation's leading institutions and was causing us to repudiate the church's conformity to a system that we believe to be biblically wrong. As a result, the evangelical left developed a new vocabulary synthesizing terms like Biblical, gospel, sin, and church with the new left's language of social power, liberation, oppression, and equality. Okay. So what he's trying to say is uh, they, Christians have noticed problems in our world, injustices, uh, corrupt institutions, and they're, they're bringing their Christianity to bear on it. But what has happened is an unhealthy synthesis uh, using terms of the modern day social justice movement that sound a lot like terms we use in the gospel, and it's creating a lot of confusion among Christianity. Owen Strachan wrote about Christianity and wokeness. He said, wokeness is a major threat to the Christian faith. Why is he saying that? That's part of what I want to explore today. Is he, right? is he even right? Maybe he's not. Even in our Lutheran Church, Missouri Synod, Dr. Lucas Woodford, the youngest district president uh, from the Minnesota South District, he says here, there is confusion and disagreement about how the social justice movement is to be understood or embraced, particularly among Christians. To be sure, he says, the Holy Christian Church in America must be ready to combat the sins of racism and injustice. Absolutely. Yet it must also guard against dangerous ideologies that would displace or even replace the love and light of Christ and his eternal word of truth as a means for our life together. Okay, So acknowledging there's problems, but also guarding against dangerous, are they dangerous ideologies? And uh, we're going to ground this whole class in these two verses. Paul writes to the Colossians, see to it that no one takes you captive through hollow and deceptive philosophy, which depends on human tradition, the elemental spiritual forces of this world, rather than on Christ. Okay? And then he says what we should do is destroy arguments and every lofty opinion raised against the knowledge of God and take every thought captive to Christ. Okay? Hence the topic, taking social justice captive to Christ. How are we going to do this? I got to get moving. I'm going to skip Body Bauckham here. Um, he is a Southern Baptist preacher, uh, very prominent in their circles. He's kind of an ostracized of late. He wrote an excellent book, Fault Lines, uh, talks all about this movement. And uh, in fact, we're going to listen to him all of lesson six, so I'm not going to talk anymore about that. Here's what we're going to do to cover this topic. Today, is an introduction to biblical social justice. What does the Bible say social justice is? We need to get our hands around what the Bible says before we can examine anything else. And we're going to measure what the 
what's out there in the world today up against scripture. So today is kind of learning to handle the real stuff so that we can recognize maybe maybe the counterfeit. Okay, that's the lesson of today. Next lesson, you might be bored out of your mind. I'm excited about it. Uh, justice in the philosophical and theological tradition. What is the best thinking in the church and in philosophy about justice over the ages? What does that look like? What is it and what isn't it? You may feel like you're just in a philosophy class next lesson, okay? Why, how is this a Bible class? Well, it all hangs together, right? The whole class is about one verse, taking social justice captive to Christ. Uh, and, and it will build. Then we're going to turn to economic justice. We're going to talk about at least one proposed solution in the history of the world. Uh, Marxism has been uh, touted as a way to fix economic injustices in societies. Why are we going to talk about Marxism? Because we have to learn more about Marxism before we get to our, our focus on racial justice and critical race theory, especially uh, because tenets of Marxism flow into this. And, and that's part of what's going to make some of it maybe a little suspect. Uh, other parts of it, we're, we're, we'll take a hard look at that. So we're going to go from economic justice to racial justice, and then we're going to go ahead and examine what I'm going to introduce to you as a term in a minute, critical social justice uh, in light of the Bible and theology. All right, so that all kind of builds up to this lesson right here. Then, because some people think that uh, a white male in today's society is is not qualified to talk about some of these kind of topics. Um, not that I believe that or that you should believe that, but I do want to uh, listen to a black voice in our midst. Uh, I found a 55 minute, just the right length video by Reverend Body Bauckham. I've previewed it several times. I don't think there's anything problematic about it. I want to give the stage to him for a lesson and hear what he has to say, all right, in our midst. Also, we have a snow day, which is possible, right, in January. I have to send you that link and we'll watch this. This is also a built in book. Finally, then we're going to ask about the way forward. What do we do, uh, having learned what we learned? How, how, how will we move forward as Christians in today's society? How are we going to confront injustice in our world without compromising truth? Because that's the goal. Okay. Any questions about that path through? All right. That's all by way of introduction. Way too long. Okay. Here we go. Here's some books I read about this. I gave you a bibliography in the back. Um, if you wanted to read alongside this class to more inform yourself, I'd say the two best books, Tim Keller's book, Generous Justice, I would say was very sympathetic to the modern day social justice movement. Uh, Kevin DeYoung's book, What is the Mission of the Church, is a good counterweight to that, looking at the other side. Both very fair texts. I would recommend them to you if you wanted to read them. Uh, the other book uh, are these two books, especially the one by Abadi Bauckham. Although I warn you, if you read this, you're going to find class very, very repetitive. All right, just to know you, I've read broad and wide. Uh, if you want to read some pro-critical social justice literature, we'll talk more about some of these concepts in a moment, but I have those in the bibliography as well. Um, don't just take my word for it if you are one of those people that's inclined to study things for yourself. Okay. What was the second one recommended? I missed it. Oh, um, the last name? Uh, Alan and Bauckham. These are going to be... These are going to be pointing out what's wrong with the movement, though. So, uh, Keller is very sympathetic to the movement. I said these books here, and we're going to talk about these authors in later lessons. Okay, the new face of justice. Here we go. Uh, you might have thought five years ago, if someone would have said the word justice, you might have thought of courtrooms, you might have thought of fair verdicts, you might have thought of uh, law enforcement, I, I don't know what might have came to your mind, but in the last couple of years, when we hear about justice, um, we talk about people demanding change, we talk about people upset about uh, injustices they've seen in society, um, we've seen violent, uh, sometimes uh, demonstrations um, that are called justice, um, and uh, there's a new face to it, it looks different. Uh, certainly than any other time in my lifetime. Um, you're hearing terms maybe that you had never heard in your life before. Terms like microaggression, intersectionality, white privilege, white fragility, systematic racism, white guilt. I mentioned woke. Um, all these things are in our vocabulary. They're in our news. Uh, they're in our conversations. Uh, this is kind of the new face of justice in our society today. Uh, and here's what uh, Mr. Balcom says about these. He says, 
those belonging to the social justice crowd present themselves as the only ones pursuing justice to the exclusion of all who disagree with their assessments, who by that definition are pursuing injustice. Okay? On the one side, they say, are compassionate Christians who actually care about justice, right? They're concerned about. It. On the other side are so-called insensitive Christians who are not concerned about justice. And he says, this is wrong. Because I believe the current concept of social justice, in his mind, is, is incompatible with biblical Christianity. Again, you've got to come to all six. I'm not, you don't have to come to all six, but we're not going to get to that today. Um, our problem is a lack of clarity and charity in our debate over the place, priority, practice, and definition of justice. He concludes by saying our problem is social justice versus biblical justice. And so what we need to do is get some terms down that are going to... Um, be important for the rest of the class. Right now, social justice has competing definitions in our world. And I'll try to not just read the screen here. Uh, social justice traditionally is defined as a virtue. The moderation between selfishness and selflessness, between having more and having less than one's fair share. Right? That's what social justice has been throughout Christianity and philosophy. Uh, a moderation between taking too much for myself, right? Or maybe between the opposite wrong of giving too much away. That can be problematic as well. It's to recognize what is my fair share, more on that as we go through the class, and trying to organize one's life accordingly. Today's social justice, uh, they use the same terminology, but it's, they mean something very different by it. Fighting embedded social inequality, pursuing equal outcomes as opposed to equal opportunities for minorities of every subculture, okay? These two things are not the same, right? One is me organizing my life around the virtue of being just, being a just person. How much do I need? How much do others need? How do I give? What do I keep for myself? Today, it's about everything in our society is an equal, and we need to make it equal. Okay. Very different things. You'll learn more about that next lesson. So going forward, these are the terms I'm going to use. Different authors will use different terms. Here's the title of the book, Why Social Justice is Not Biblical Justice. All right. Well, justice by nature is social. By nature, must be social. You can't, if you're the only person in the world, there's no such thing as justice, right? There's no resources to divide. There's no, it's just you. So justice is always social in nature. But there's a difference between biblical social justice and what society calls today as critical social justice. And those are not equal. So moving forward, these are the terms I'm going to use. I'm going to either talk about the critical social justice movement, modern day social justice that you see on the news, or what the Bible says about social justice. Sometimes they match up, don't get me wrong, but at their core, they're very different ways of seeing our world. Okay, so what are the two terms? Critical social justice, biblical social justice. Friedrich Hayek, uh, world class Nobel Prize economist and philosopher, said this. I'll just plant this out there. He says, I have come to feel strongly that the greatest service I can still render to my fellow man is that I could make the speakers and writers among them thoroughly ashamed to ever again employ the term social justice. He thinks that the term is so co-opted, it means something so much different than what justice has meant in the history of the world that he doesn't want the term to even be used anymore. Now again, I got to make a case for that. You may not agree with that. By the way, if you think sitting through this class is going to not allow you to uh, listen to a sermon from me in the future or ever come to one of my Bible classes again, um, I, would, I would encourage you to, you know, consider doing something different with your Sunday morning. Not that I don't want you here, um, but I'm taking on this topic because I think it's important. Uh, and I promise, I, you know, I usually turn this light on here uh, when I'm saying something that's just my opinion. I promise I'm going to try to say stuff. When I evaluate the critical social justice movement, I'm going to try to make sure it's not my opinion. 
that there's a chapter and verse there. Okay. But I am fully aware that not everybody in this room is going to agree with some of the conclusions this class might draw. And I respect you as a Christian if you see things otherwise. Again, I'm going to try to talk about where the social justice movement touches on the theological core of our faith. That's what I'm going to evaluate. Um, we may walk out of here agreeing to disagree, but I still love you as a brother or sister in Christ, right? And that's part of the dialogue that we need to have together as, as a church today as well. You won't cancel me. You won't cancel me, all right. <laughs> all right, here we go. Biblical social justice. Terry, what time am I supposed to be at here? Six, seven minutes behind. All right. Most important part, and I'm dragging my feet. Today's big thinkers, uh, not too hard here. Moses and the prophets, Jesus and St. Paul. I'm going to try to tell you where the ideology we're talking about comes from. Here's the most famous verse in all of scripture on justice. Uh, Amos 5.24, let justice roll on like a river and righteousness like a never failing stream. Uh, the words justice and righteousness occur together in scripture, I think over 30 times in the Old Testament, uh, virtually indistinguishable from one another. And I'm sorry I turned my back on you guys over here. It's just that my screen is over here. Okay, so I love you too. Um, <laughs> Let's take a look at these words. The Hebrew word for justice is mishpat. Say that with me, mishpat. All right? Uh, occurs all over the place. Uh, at its base, it means uh, just or straight, uh, a fair legal decision. Uh, in Greek, the word is, is crisis. It means uh, judgment well, or, or justice in, in English, okay? So the idea here is fairness. Do what's fair. People disagree about what fair is, but just at its base, do what's fair. Righteousness, on the other hand, say it's sedekah. Sedekah, yeah. Uh, blameless behavior can also just mean right or just. I think the distinction, if there is any, between justice and righteousness is that justice is about the concept of fairness, and righteousness sometimes speaks more to just behavior or fair behavior in the world. Okay? But they're almost indistinguishable as concepts. Now, Righteousness in Greek is dikaiosune. That's an important word, right? This starts the Reformation. Uh, you remember Luther is up in his uh, castle tower reading Romans 117, and it says, uh, the righteousness of God is revealed, a righteousness that is by faith. The righteous will live by faith, the dikaiosune. And he thought the righteousness of God meant God's righteousness, which he looks down upon us as judge. And then he has this discovery. He says, the gates of heaven were open to me when I realized the righteousness of God meant the righteousness that God bestows on me because I'm his child. I am righteous because he has declared me so, right? That's what the righteousness of God or from God means. And so uh, this very word starts the whole uh, Reformation movement. All right. Transitioning into the biblical concept of justice. Uh, Alan writes, ideas have consequences, but they also have antecedents. That is, they come from somewhere. The true definition of justice finds its source in the Bible and has expressed itself historically in ways that have blessed nations. So when the church intentionally or unintentionally exchanges the biblical definition of a word as important as justice with a counterfeit, it is no small matter. Is what he's saying is if the Bible defines justice one way and the church is talking about justice in a different way than scripture, then that's a problem. And that's a problem. <laughs> Kevin DeYoung writes these words. He said, God hates injustice. Should be obvious to us all. But injustice must be defined in the Bible's terms, not ours. Injustice implies a corrupted judicial system, an arbitrary legal code, outright cruelty of the poor, what does it mean to do justice? That's the million dollar question. And it must be answered, here's a big word, many of you know it, exegetically. To exegete a Bible text means to pull meaning out of the text. Eggs out of. Eisegesis, on the other hand, would be to start with my predetermined meaning and read it into the text. Eis is the preposition in, right? So I got an idea. Now let me open my Bible and find the Bible verses that I can marshal to support, right? We've all done this. Whereas exegesis says, I'm going to try to set aside all my preconceived notions of what justice is. I'm just going to pull it out of the text. 
can let that define it, right? So is it women's rights? Is it racial inequality? Is it equal access to education? You hear all these things clamoring about as justice. What does the Bible say justice is? Tim Keller helps us uh, very greatly in this respect. I could put up tons of Bible verses. I put up the most characteristic of them. Uh, justice, he says, is central to what God would have us do. You've heard this verse. He has told you, O man, what is good and what does the Lord require of you but to do justice. Love kindness to walk humbly with your God. Justice is often directed as what he calls the quartet of the vulnerable. Zechariah 7, thus says the Lord of hosts, render true judgments. Show kindness and mercy to one another. Do not oppress the widow, the fatherless, the sojourner, or the poor. Those four, the quartet, the widow, the fatherless, the sojourner, and the poor. And let none of you devise evil against one another in your heart. You see again in Proverbs 31, defend the rights of the poor and needy. Speak up for those who cannot speak for themselves. And so certainly justice in scripture is directed at those in our society whose fortunes are less than others maybe don't have the same kind of opportunities as others who maybe uh, by no fault of their own don't have access to uh, the same kind of wealth or jobs right those who grew up fatherless about money in the bank uh, the church should have a special concern for those kinds of people why well justice reflects the character of our god whom we're called to emulate psalm 146 he, God, executes justice for the oppressed. He gives food to the hungry. The Lord sets the prisoners free. The Lord opens the eyes of the blind. The Lord lifts up those who are bowed down. The Lord loves the righteous. The Lord watches over the sojourners. He upholds the widow and the fatherless. There you see those themes again. Deuteronomy 10. I'll just read the blue part. God, who is not partial and takes no bribe, executes justice for the fatherless, the widow, and loves the sojourner, giving him food and clothing. Okay. Finally, uh, a huge point I think that can't be overlooked is justice always includes generosity. Okay. Ezekiel 18, if a man is righteous and does what is just and right, he does not oppress anyone, but restores to the debtor his pledge, commits no robbery, gives his bread to the hungry, covers the naked with a garment, does not lend an interest or take any profit, withholds his hand from injustice, executes true justice between man and man. Finally, James 2, another familiar verse. If a brother or sister is poorly clothed and lacking daily food, and one of you says to him, go in peace, be warmed and filled without giving the things he needs for the body, what good is that? So also faith by itself, if it does not have works, is dead. Okay. So even though much of this class might be aimed at looking at what's maybe problematic about today's current rendition of justice, uh, let not you, the hearer of these words, be confused. Let not this let you off the hook of your responsibility, of our responsibility as the church for caring for those in our midst. We'll talk more about that as the lesson goes on, especially that last lesson, uh, and bringing about a more just world. Uh, if you walk out of here after seven weeks and think, Pastor says there's a lot of problems with the current social justice movement. I'm just going to keep that money in my pocketbook that I might have used to help others. Uh, you have missed, right? You have missed the point of the class. Um, the church is called especially to care for the poor and the needy, and the poor and needy, especially in our midst, not across the world, not far away necessarily, but in our immediate circumstances and midst. I'm getting a little ahead of myself. Um, but notice that that's the church that's called to do that because generosity is a requirement. Sometimes where the current movement goes astray is they look not to the church who have changed hearts to do these works, but to a sovereign state, right? Who may be unregenerate in their hearts and can't execute generosity because the Holy Spirit isn't at work in and through them. Okay. Here is a good summary of biblical justice. If, if I had nine classes, um, one of the other classes would be just looking at Bible texts. Okay. 
But here is a, is a great summary, I think, of, of how justice is portrayed in Scripture. First of all, it primarily involves the courtroom. It wants a fair process. It does not seek an equal outcome. That means if you are being tried for a crime, that it should be a fair decision. Regardless of whether you're rich or poor, or black or white, or fatherless, or two parents. Okay? A fair process, not an equal outcome. Apply the law equally, judge without partiality, strive for truth. That means no bribes, no backroom deals, no slanderous judgments, no breaking promises, no taking advantage of the, that's spelled obviously wrong, the weak. Okay. A lot of times when the Bible is railing against injustice, it's recognizing that the poor in the land don't have the same kind of resources as the rich, and so they're not being treated fairly in the courtroom because they don't have the money to slip to the judge behind the scenes to get him to bend the will of the law in their favor. Okay, That's especially why you need to take care of the downtrodden because they're more likely to be exploited. But we want a fair process. Disparity in outcome is not a sign of injustice. But disparity in the process would certainly be. Okay. Introducing some concepts we'll talk about later. All right. In the community, just as we get along with one another, the Bible's concerned with sharing with one another, speaking the truth. Lying is an injustice. Don't take advantage of the weak. There, I got it spelled right there. Be fair. Reason things out. Use your reason. Use your God-given gifts of your brain to live in harmony with your neighbor. Help them out when they need it so that they can in turn help you out, etc. Towards the poor. Let's face it. A lot of the social justice movement is about income inequality. That's what a lot of the main driver of it is. All right? In scripture, taking care of the poor means caring for them and giving them opportunities to succeed. I'm going to say this once, but it's important. Doing justice is not the same in scripture as the redistribution of resources. The only example you can find of that is the year of Jubilee. Too many of you are familiar with Leviticus. Every 49 years, land would be returned. All these kind of things would be redistributed. We could probably have a whole class looking at the year of Jubilee and talking about how that might or might not apply to our society today. I would love to do that. But uh, if you'd like, on the side, send me an email. I'll send you an article or a chapter of a book that will completely dismantle that notion that somehow we could do the year of Jubilee in our world today. First of all, Israel never did. Okay, so I'm aware of the year of Jubilee. I'm not overlooking that passage. I'm just dismissing it as applicable to this conversation. All right? You can disagree with me. That's okay. All right. Disparity between rich and the poor is not equated with <laughs> oppression in Scripture. All right? Poverty itself does not indicate injustice. The poor in Scripture, in fact, by contrast, are often called the pious poor. They're the ones who truly need God and trusted him. It's the rich who often scoff at God. However, defrauding the weak and helpless for personal advantage is always and everywhere an injustice. We should not take advantage of those who are weak or helpless in our midst. So what is a summary of the just Christian life? Not stealing, not bribing, not cheating, not swindling, robbing, murdering, accepting bribes, defrauding, holding back fair wages, showing partiality. All those things you would find in the context of the word justice in the Old Testament and in Scripture. But rather, it's showing grace and generosity to others in need. All right, here's where it gets a little tricky. Well, not tricky. This is just interesting. Hebrew and Greek have their words for justice and righteousness. But as you know, the language of the church for the better part of 2,000 years was Latin. What do you notice about the Latin word for justice and righteousness? The same word, right? Justitia. Right? Uh, simultaneously, just 
Eustace et peccata, did you learn that in confirmation? Simultaneously just, consider that's the word there. Um, has the same connotations, however, but it can be used interchangeably. So when Luther is talking about the righteousness of God being revealed, what was he reading in his Latin Vulgate? The justice of God being revealed. Okay. And Luther said there were many kinds of righteousness, or we could just as easily translate that justice. And he says we have to know the difference between Christian righteousness and all other kinds of righteousness. Christian righteousness, he says, is a passive righteousness before God, Coram Deo, by which he declares me a forgiven child of God. What do I do? Nothing. I stand there and be made alive by his proclamation. You are forgiven. That's what's going on in confession and absolution in church, right? I'm being declared righteous, regardless of my behavior, right? On account of my faith, which he has given me. I do nothing. He says there's all other kinds of righteousness before our fellow man, active righteousness. They don't do anything to secure our status with God. Right? We're against works righteousness, in case you haven't figured that out. We don't work our way to heaven. But works have their place for our fellow man. Have you heard the joke about the guy who gets up to heaven and said, all these good works for you, God. And he said, you should have left them down on earth for your neighbor who actually needed them. If we're talking about many kinds of righteousness or many kinds of justice, uh, here's just some things from the Ten Commandments that we could talk about. You could say the second table of the Ten Commandments, four through ten, about loving our neighbor, are all concerned about social justice. The Eighth Commandment is concerned about legal justice. Don't bear false witness against your neighbor. Because if you lie and say something, he did something that he didn't do, he may be tried in the court of law or in the court of public opinion, and his reputation will be damaged. And that will not be good for him. The seventh commandment, we could say that's concerned about economic justice, right? Do not steal. But what does Luther say? Help our neighbor improve and protect his property and income. Don't take it in any dishonest way. We could even say maybe the fifth commandment is concerned about racial justice. Do not murder. What did Jesus say? If you call your brother a fool, you've committed murder. You're in danger of the fires of hell. And so if I'm going to spew racial slurs or look down on someone else because of the color of their skin, I'm breaking the fifth commandment. I'm tearing them down. Someone who's made in the holy image of God. Okay? There's many, many kinds of righteousness in our world. Any questions so far? How am I doing, Terry? I'm back on track, aren't I? Oh, I've got eight minutes to do the last 15-minute segment here. I'm looking around. Here's your chance to talk. By the way, I'm introducing these because we're going to talk about economic justice, racial justice. Uh, legal justice, I don't have a separate segment on that. Um, but I'm going to bring in some statistics later on in a, in a lesson that you can agree or disagree with. All right. Lastly, um, I want to introduce you to something uh, I read in a book by Jonathan Haidt called The Righteous Mind. Um, these concepts were just published in a book about uh, weird people. I'll get to that in a minute. And reviewed in the Concordia Seminary Academic Journal. So even our Lutheran theologians at seminary are beginning to talk about these things. Um, and this didn't fit anywhere else in the lesson, but I think it's still uh, important to kind of set the stage moving forward. So um, this guy is a sociologist, not really a Christian, but uh, worried about why we're so divided, and especially in America, between liberal and conservative. And he did a lot of research over years. And, and what he found is, there are five moral foundations present in almost every society. You can think of these like taste buds, okay? So care or harm, all right? Let me, let me get this uh, straight here so it goes with your hand out. Who does this hurt in our world? That's some things people ask when they're talking about what is righteous or what is good in our world. Who does this hurt or harm? Uh, another component of righteousness in our world is fairness or cheating the question being asked is is this fair 
And by the way, on the right there, I put some Bible verses to show that I think these things are, are also present in Scripture and our God is concerned about them, not just, you know, sociologists doing research. Uh, loyalty or betrayal. How does this affect our group cohesion together, our getting along together in the world? Authority and subversion. How does this affect our societal order? We need to be concerned about that. And finally, sanctity and degradation. Does this maintain purity? Does this maintain purity in our world? Let me just talk about sanctity and degradation a little bit. Um, those who, who have strong taste buds for this moral component would see something like the American flag being burnt, burned and stomped in the street, and they would say, no, that is a, a symbol of our freedom, as our nation. Don't burn that, right? That would be abhorrent to someone with a strong taste bud for that moral foundation. Others may say, who cares? It's a dumb flag. Men made it up. There's injustice going on in this nation. Stomp all over it to make a point to make it better for these other people who are being harmed. Right? So in societies across the world, they did studies on the taste buds of people. And here's something interestingly they found, all right? They found that in most of the world and among conservatives in North America, there's about an equal preference for all these areas. In other words, we're concerned about all of them equally. They've asked questionnaire after questionnaire among different demographics, different people, changed the questions if they were leading, all this kind of stuff. They continue to find these results. In North America, on the other hand, those who tend to be uh, maybe classify themselves as much more socially liberal, again and again, show a strong preference for only the care and harm and fairness components. What this means is they're most concerned about is someone being hurt or not? Or is this fair or not? How does this affect our group cohesion? How does this affect our societal order? Who cares? I don't want anybody hurt and I don't want anybody treated unfairly. Right? Height and some of his fellow researchers call those kinds of people weird. Now you may think of being weird as you know, a slur, you know, a slander, you're weird, but actually it's an acronym. He says, this mindset has only and ever existed, as far as we know, in weird societies and are an outlier compared to the rest of the entire planet. Weird, finally, stands for Western, educated, industrial, rich, and democratic societies. In other words, Europe and America. Right? Those kind of conditions have allowed for people to largely ignore other moral foundations that other societies in every time and place have known are absolutely important for a society to function well. Right? Why? Well, there's a lot of people talking about this. This is turning a lot of heads. And what people are saying is because we've mostly lived in a society with fair processes, no order, go to sleep in peace at night. Uh, we have had sort of the privilege of ignoring some of these other moral foundations to the expense of others. Now, I'm not here to say whether that's right or wrong or judge fairly or not. What I'm here to say is that most North Americans and even North American Christians see the moral foundations of the world and taste those moral foundations much differently than societies of most times and places have because our existence since the Industrial Revolution is unique from any other time that humans have ever lived. Does that make sense? So I'm just introducing this concept as something to think about um, because I think it's important to, to recognize um, what's going on in our society today. What do you see being stirred up in the news media a lot? Issues of care and harm, fairness and cheating. 
right? The others I see, in, at least in my mind, tend to be largely ignored. Now, I want to close by talking specifically about societal harm. Uh, some advocate that private behavior is not inherently harmless, right? What I do in private doesn't hurt anyone. Um, it's not inherently harmless because it shapes the kind of people we become and how we interact with others in society. So who cares if I watch pornography? How does that hurt the world? Well, research shows that it rewires my brain in ways that I don't even aware of and know about. And my brain goes out into the world and interacts with other people. But also then I create a market for that by which others are exploited, right? So this idea that me and myself and you don't worry about it, it doesn't hurt anybody else is logically flawed. But an even bigger issue with this care harm component is there's no common definition of what is harmful to a society. Because all of us have different views on what a healthy, flourishing human life looks like. Man's proper goal or end, the way he's supposed to behave and live, uh, philosophers have called his telos or his rightful end, his goal as a human being. Uh, if we don't agree on that, then we're not going to agree on what's harmful or not. Here's a good example. What is the proper telos of marriage? How you answer that question will determine whether or not you find homosexuality harmful to a society, right? If you think God has designed marriage a certain way and to function this way in our world, and that's how societies are going to flourish because that's man's true end and tell us, then you're going to say, this is not, not harmful to the rest of the world because it affects our entire society and how it functions. If you don't have that vision of the telos of marriage, then you're gonna say, what's the big deal, right? The two guys wanna get married and adopt a kid or two girls, now even trying to have men have, have babies or something like that, what's wrong with that? You know, because we don't have an agreed concept of man's end. And so, you know, that's something as we argue or debate with people in our world, maybe someone at work or in our family, uh, we're just shouting past each other if we don't say, What's God's end for this? And if we don't agree on that, well, then we're never going to agree on the, the whatever topic is at hand for the day. Sometimes you have to back up and say, where are we disagreeing? We think we're disagreeing about marriage, but really we're disagreeing about God and what he says that marriage is. Okay? So when we get to talking about justice, then we have to measure it up against the yardstick of God's word and what it has to say. All right, I have eight minutes left. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I threw you in a few different directions today. Um, I, I'm waiting for hands to go up. Um, oh, I didn't advance my chart, did I? Uh -oh. For those of you watching, uh, all one of you, this is the chart that you should have been looking at. All right, great. So where are we going? Well, today we tried to talk about what biblical social justice is and isn't. I do that through other things as well. Next, you're going to get a philosophy course in justice, which I think is very helpful. I really do. And then we'll get into the dicey stuff, right? Notice we're building towards what I think is probably the hottest button topic, that of racial justice. Um, we're trying to lay the foundation so that when we get there, we're talking on a level playing field. So we don't just dive into this huge, potentially controversial topic without anything grounding us together. Yes, Doc? Um, on your chart where you talk about uh, very liberal to very conservative, yeah. and at the beginning there, for the liberal, the uh, scores are three, three and a half for cops, practically. Yes. Does that represent a greater depth of feeling about those issues, do they feel people who accept that as a, from a liberal position? They well, they took a questionnaire with topics like, for instance, how do you feel about burning American flag right, or something like that? How, is that not relevant at all or extremely relevant, right? And so you, you know, you know what I mean. So they they and this is their this is the average their average score across questions that ask for those kind of components. Right? 
So did they identify the, the top group identified as themselves as literal? Yeah, they, they self-identified themselves exactly. in advance. Right, they, yeah, yeah, sorry. I didn't do a very good job presenting that. And, and, and all this what I was trying to say is, um, I do think that, that each of these things are important in society. I'm not here to wait how important they are. I'm just observationally saying that this is a weird phenomenon in our society that people can exist by preferring only these things when the rest of the world knows they have to prefer all these things somewhat equally, all right? Um, it's, it's, a, it's an outlier in humanity, yes. Yes. I'm going to ask you the development of the community. Yeah. I'm going to address some of that issue that arises when a dispute over whether something has a wrong hinge on authority. Because the test is taking place between the person who thinks that authority is an important part of the test and a man, the person who thinks that authority. So she asked, um, are we going to address how to adjudicate between two people who have a different opinion and one thinks uh, listening to authority is important and the other one maybe doesn't see that as important. Uh, that's not really the direction of the class. As I said, this thing I just presented to you, which you seem to have found the most interesting all of you, which is fine, um, uh, is just kind of just a, a, a add on to today's lesson. Um, just to talk about care and harm, because when we talk about what is man's fair share or his, what does man do next lesson, what, what do we owe our fellow man? Do we owe him health insurance? Do we owe him you know, a certain amount of money or housing or things like that? Uh, we have to realize that there's, a, there's an end there that we're, we're striving towards. Um, so no, we're not really going to address that because that's not the focus of the class. Uh, we're more going to get into, uh, like I said, economic imbalances, uh, racial prejudices, how critical social justice wants to handle those things, and how we as Christians should perhaps instead handle those things, or embrace parts of the critical social justice movement while distancing ourselves from other parts. So, no, sorry to disappoint you. Yeah, over here. At the same time, uh, you are looking at the Bible to be restored. So, well, yes. yes. <laughs> yeah, okay, right. So, and that's kind of what I tell people in a new member class, right? Uh, if you don't think this is God's word, you can sit through the class, but I don't know why. You know, I mean, if we don't agree this is God's word, we have no foundation on which we're making things. Now, here's, here's the problem, right? Those say, I think that's God's word, but I read it this way and you read it this way. Okay. Okay. So when I'm critiquing something based on God's word, if you think I'm reading that the wrong way, you know, raise your hand and say, why are you reading it that way versus another way? So I kind of said that today with the year of Jubilee. Um, that's a favorite, favorite thing in scripture from critical social justice proponents. See, if every 50 years, they just wipe the slate clean and everybody started with an even keel. Well, there's a very good reason why they did that in an agricultural society where if you didn't have a field, you had no way to make money. Um, that's totally not congruent with the society we live in today. And so to just say these principles automatically apply wouldn't be a very good thing, right? And yet the principle of looking out for those who've been disadvantaged remains. But yes, Doc. Will you define critical theory at some point? Yes. So um, after we look at what what the best theologians in the in the Bible have said about justice, from sort of a pure point of the word, uh, then we're going to look at economic injustice. We're going to clearly define Marxist ideology and critique that. The reason we need to do that is because that in large part feeds into what today is known as critical race theory, right? And so we can't rightly evaluate critical race theory until we know where it comes from. So we're gonna look at critical race theory and then we're gonna take an evaluation of that. And that'll be two separate lessons because that's just too much. So in the lesson in which we present critical race theory, I'm just gonna present it to you. 
Now, there may be things I tip my hat for critiquing, but I'm trying to just give you that. What is it? What is it? And then we'll come back the next lesson and say, what do we do with that? All right, next. So we're not going to get into democratic socialism versus Marxism. We're going to go deeper. We're going to peel back the onion. What are the tenets that behind Marxism that cause it to fail? Right? Do those tenets appear up in, the, in this other ideology or not? Okay. If they do, that should raise some flags for us. If they don't, don't worry about it. Okay. So I don't really care about Marxism or democracy or democratic socialism or anything like that. What I care about are the tenets and the worldviews that undermine these philosophies, are they at odds with scripture? And if they are at odds with scripture, then they would be problematic in any system in which they are employed. Does that make sense? All right, yes, yeah, a couple more, two more. Mercy and grace, right. <laughs> well, mercy and grace are going to be important to us caring for the poor and needy as the church. Um, but we're, we're, we're more trying to recognize the worldviews that are out there that we're imbibing and say, are these acceptable for Christians to straws for us to drink from? Okay, so. Uh, the class is taking social justice, capital crisis, the focus really remains on uh, social justice itself. Right? Not that those other things are important and ask questions about them as they go, but you know, we can't make one class about everything. Okay. All right, good. Well, my voice held out. Uh, you held out. Uh, if you're not totally nonplussed, come back next week and uh, we'll go from there. Thank you very much. Uh -huh.